And can we stand this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Why don't you look over at somebody you hadn't spoke to or, or shake their hand or just tell them you love them and encourage somebody a little bit this morning. Amen. It's, it's good to be with God's people today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Now that we have fellowship just for a second, why don't we fellowship with him just for a second? Why don't we lift up our hands and just worship the Lord? Hallelujah. Come on, let's ask him to be here with us this morning. Let's invite his presence here today. God, we want you in the midst, Lord, of this service today. Hallelujah. Lord, speak to us this morning through your word. Hallelujah. Knowing our minds, oh God, our ears that we could hear and receive your word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us today, Jesus. Help us today. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. And Sister Dalton is going to be teaching. Come on up here, sister. Amen. She's going to be teaching the word this morning, and we're excited about that. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as Sister Dalton comes, amen, and gives us what the Lord has given her. Thank you, Brother Stanley. It's so good to be in God's house this morning, isn't it? Praise the Lord. God's so good to us. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Just for the privilege of being able to come and to worship Him today in spirit and in truth, and then the privilege of having a desire to come. There's people in this world that have no desire to be in God's house. But I thank the Lord that I have a desire to come into His presence. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. We are so happy today for all the blessings of the Lord, and, and I thank the Lord for this privilege. God has blessed me so abundantly. And I appreciate Brother and Sister Burks that have confidence in me that I can do this job. I, I, I can't do it without the help of the Lord. But um, God has been good to me. Praise the Lord. He's been good to all of us. Praise the Lord. I'm going to let you be seated uh, because we're going to be studying the Word of the Lord this morning. And, and uh, the Lord has really been talking to my heart and uh, he talked to me about several things, but one of the things that, that has really made an impression on me, and I want to impress us with it today, is that we have some precious promises from His Word that we need to learn, have them written on the table of our heart, and use them against the wiles of the enemy. We ask ourselves, how did Jesus handle Satan when he came before him and offered him things that Jesus already owned, praise the Lord. But Jesus used the word against him. And that's what we need to learn to do. Not try to do it in our own might and in our own power, but to use the word against him, praise the Lord. The word is forever settled. And I'm so thankful that Brother Burks has encouraged each one of us to read the Bible through. Because we each need to have that word settled in our own heart. We know and we've mentioned before, there's people in this world that's depending on somebody else to understand what God's going to require of them. To hear him say, well done. But we need to know what thus saith the word of God is. And have it settled in our heart, praise the Lord, not only to use against the enemy as he comes against us, and it's not always the enemy that comes against us. When we begin to really take inventory, we find that our old flesh is our greatest enemy. And we need to keep that word in our heart to use against our own lust of the flesh. And you might say, well, Sister Dalton, what is that? It varies between individuals. Things that you have problems with, I may not have a problem one with. And things that I battle, you may not have a, a problem with. 
But we need to have the Word of God settled in our heart that we know what God requires of us and how we need to uh, be obedient to His Word. The Bible said obedience is better than sacrifice. And so we need to learn uh, His Word that we can be obedient to His Word. Uh, we find today we want to look at the Word of uh, the Lord in Second Peter, the first chapter. We want to consider what Brother Peter had to say about us. When we begin to think about how Israel was deceived and how they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, it was not Satan that caused them to wander for 40 years. It was their doubt in God's Word, their unbelief in God's Word, and their fear of what was ahead. We as God's people need to stand up, use the Word of God as a weapon in our hand, and find that we can be victorious in the name of Jesus. Not in our own might, not in our own power, but through the Word of God and the power of our God, the Spirit of our God. Praise the Lord. We find in the first chapter, beginning at verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. What a precious promise today. That if we are rooted and grounded in the promises of God and obedient to his word, that we will never fall. In this day and hour, Brother Peter here is telling us about a day that was going to come that was going to have a lot of uh, corrupt teachers and scoffers that was going to rise up. And that was even in his day and how much more in the day and hour that we live in. And I don't know about you, but I realize more and more that I need God to direct my steps. I can't find the way alone. I don't know the direction to go. But through His Word, we have a map. Let's all look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank You today, Lord, for the privilege of coming together to study Your Word. And God, we desire that we might be able to hear from You. God, we pray that you would anoint our ears and our heart, God, that we might understand what you would say to us today, God. We want to be overcomers, God. We're in a race for our soul. We want to inherit eternal life, and God, it will only be in obedience to you and to your word. We pray that your blessings and your anointing would rest upon us this morning. Bless and work your will in each one of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
As I said a few minutes ago, there's so many deceitful things going on in the world that we live in until we really don't know what to believe and what not to believe as far as what's going on around us. The newscast, articles that we read, every encounter that we have, we don't know whether it's truth or whether it's a deceit. I felt so insufficient when it came time to vote and we went to vote and we diligently prayed, God, anoint our minds, God, that we might know where to put that mark, God, which candidate would be best that we could have the freedoms that we enjoy. They are advertising. I tell you, I told my sister-in-law yesterday, I went to the mailbox and I had another handful of of uh, paraphernalia wanting my vote. I've already voted. It's too late. But I said to her as I walked up the, uh, the, the sidewalk to the house and she was waiting for me there, I said, I wish I had the money that this one man has spent on postage in this campaign. And she said, isn't it the truth? Every day, Not one, but sometimes two or three things coming in the mail. And wanting my vote, uh, Brother Dalton, he got a call and they said, we want you to do a survey. Well, it's too late for a survey. Number one, I don't do surveys because it's none of their business who I vote for. I found out a long time ago the best way to start a big argument and even a fight is to start talking about religion or politics. But we live in a day and an hour when we cannot turn a deaf ear to what's going on around us anymore. Too long have we been complacent and we've allowed others to make our decisions and we've allowed people to stay in positions too long and they have abused their power and that's why our nation is in the condition it's in today. Why didn't we put a term uh, limit on those offices when we put it on the presidency many, many years ago. We would have a different outcome today, but we have allowed the wrong people to make decisions for us. But I'm so thankful that in the midst of my ignorance and my complacency that God has mercy And God can still, through His power, turn some things around and cause us to have the time for the revival that He intends to pour out upon His people and a calling of those that have gone astray. I believe God is still in control in this day and hour. Praise the Lord. He's never lost any of His power. He can still step up to the prefaces of time and call attention to what he wants to say to each one of us, praise the Lord. God is still in control. He is still in control. I want us to look for a few minutes at that verse 4. He said, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So Peter was warning us, but at the same time he was reminding us of God's promises to each one of us. It's time we looked into the Word of God, got a grip on these promises, and used them in our everyday personal life. I I remember many times I have two or three little candy stick scriptures that I use on a regular basis. And I'm so thankful that I don't have to do these things that I encounter in life alone. But I call attention to uh, the promises of God. Number one, he promised us guidance. In John 16 and 13, he said, How be it when he... The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. Now, what's he talking about there? He's talking about his spirit. 
the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit that comes into our life. And that's why it's so necessary that we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because without that power in our life, we're open prey for the enemy and what he would bring against us. I remember uh, a few years ago, and I don't remember the name of the book, but anyway, uh, there was a book out about the spirits that we encounter, the evil spirits that are at work in the world that we live in. And anybody with um, any intelligence at all realizes there are evil spirits working in our world. And even more so than most of us even realize. Uh, I tell my husband sometimes I... Uh, if we knew what all was really going on, we'd really be scared, Brother Wesley. But I remember the people at work was really involved in this, and, and uh, they were talking about it, and they asked me, said, what do you think about it? And I said, I think that's very real. I do. But I'm not worried about it. And they said, well, how can you just uh, accept it like that? I said, because God gave us an antidote. He gave us a promise that we would receive the Holy Ghost if we obeyed, repented of our sins, was baptized in the name of Jesus. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he said, it's not just to you, but it's to your children and to them that are far off. And so God gave us an antidote for whatever the devil throws at us. And you might say, well, how can you be sure? Because the Bible also tells me that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so what I need to do is to get that Holy Ghost that the Bible promised, keep it alive and well in my heart and life, Be obedient to it as it leads and guides and opens my understanding and stay humble before God. And then I don't have to worry about all those spirits because they can't touch me. I'm protected through the power of God's Spirit. Praise the Lord. He may throw lots of things at us, but great and precious are the promises of our God. And He will guide us. And I need his guidance in this day and hour that we live in so much. You might say, oh, Sister Dalton, you've been in this so long. You've learned the walk and you've learned the talk. Yeah, I do. I know the walk and I know the talk. But it takes more than that. It takes more than just knowing the walk and the talk. Because I encounter all along the way situations that I never dealt with before and things that I never thought about before and things that I never heard about before. But nevertheless, I know that my God still lives. Praise the Lord. He's alive and well. He has everything in His hand today. And they cannot touch me. Nothing can touch me that God does not allow. And if He allows it, He's going to take me through it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's going to work it for my good. Praise the Lord. They might mean it for evil toward me, but God's going to turn it around for good for me. Praise the Lord. He said that he would give us victory over temptation. Now, we know that according to Brother James that each one of us is drawn away by our own lust. So we're tempted along the way. Not that God sends a temptation to us. He doesn't. But with every temptation, He does make a way of escape for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. You mean to tell me somebody else walked down this road before me? That's what He said. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Somebody said to me one time, said, well, he's got more confidence in me than I do. (laughs) God knows us better than we know ourselves. You might say, oh, when I sister Dalton, I know myself. Yeah, we do know ourselves to a certain extent. But we don't know everything about ourselves. 
But God knows us. And we may not have reached that place where we feel like we can overcome the situation. But if we will allow God to work through us, we'll find out that we're more than able to conquer whatever it is, the temptation that comes our way. He said, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Well, now, I don't know about you, but he's still working on me. That little old song that the kids sing, you know, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. He's still working on me. I haven't learned it all, Brother Burks. I still got a ways to go. But I've learned enough to know that God desires for me to be victorious. He desires for me to be saved. He desires for me to be an overcomer. He does not desire for any of us to be lost. But it's His desire that every one of us would be ready to meet him and to hear him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He promised us his presence would always be with us. Matthew 28 and 20, Jesus said, Now Jesus said this, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God's not going to lead you out there and then just drop you or leave you out there and and forget about your need. But he knows exactly where you are, what you're going through, and he's already made a way of escape, and he's going to be with you even until the end of the world. What a precious promise. These are promises that are made to us that he desires for us to claim. Praise the Lord. And this isn't nothing new. Every one of you know this as well as I do. But we just need to be reminded every now and then. And it's kind of like here a few weeks ago, I'll say a couple of months ago, maybe six weeks, let's say. God began to deal with me uh, about the scripture, be ye kind one to another and I began to work on it and uh, the Lord began to really talk to me and I found out that um, that scripture was really for me God was talking to me Uh, Brother Dalton went through his episode and he's still in a uh, time of, of recovery And we've learned some things after 50 years. Number one, I never combed his hair before. And I still hadn't done it right. But I've tried. I've done my best. And he said to me, he said the first time we was trying it, he said, "Uh, we've been together 50 years. You know how I wear my hair. He's wore it that same way for 50 years, too. And uh, I said, well, now, look here. I said, I've never combed your hair before, and I never had a little boy to practice on, except Case, and I've I've had to comb his, but he usually wears his short and crew cut. And I said, you think back about when I was handicapped and couldn't move my arm, and what did you do? Well, he had some girls he could call up and say, get over here and comb your mama's hair. (laughs) But be ye kind. Sometimes we take for granted the people that are the closest to us, our spouse. How do we speak to them and how do we treat them and how do we react to them? And when they say something to us that rubs us the wrong way, how do we react? Do we react to them like we do to friends or somebody out in the workplace? No, sometimes we take our frustration out on those that are the closest to us. And we need to realize that that we need to be kind one to another. Now, as I said now, if that don't fit you, well, that's a shoe for me. I've got to wear it. 
Next thing we want to talk about prayer. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever thing, you did, so ever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, remember, it's not going to be on our time clock, because we used to the microwave. We used to hurry up, don't wait. But it's on God's time. But God will give us an assurance. Have you ever got down to pray about something that you were really now? I know that we get down and we pray and, and that's good and all. But it, sometimes there's a, a desperation that comes our way. We really need an answer. And we get desperate about it. And we get down and we begin to seek God and, and ask God to intervene in that situation. We may not see an answer. We don't know how in the world it's going to be taken care of, but we know that God is going to have to make a way for us. He's going to have to touch us. He's going to have to do something. And if we could have the faith as a little child, you know, our girls, they always thought their daddy could do anything. If they broke something, they'd say, don't worry about it, Mama. Daddy can fix it. <laughs> and he usually could some way or other weld it or glue it or do something to it. And that's the way with our God, if we can have that kind of faith. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but God, i got to have some relief. i got to have you to move. i got to have you to open a door, God. I've got to have you, Lord, to touch me, God, whatever the need is. i got to have an answer. Didn't he tell us to ask and to seek and to knock? And he's always there in our time of peril. How much more will he do for us than our, than our earthly father? Our earthly father, all you fathers are the same. If you're not, you ought to be. Your child is in trouble and he needs help. And he ask, they ask you for help. You're going to do everything you can to help. You never stop being daddy. You never stop being mama. I don't care how old they are. and They stand up and say, Mama, I'm 50 years old. I know what I'm doing. Well, do they really? <laughs> that 50-year-old is standing there. looks like he's two years old back there. <laughs> Maybe 15 years old. That's when they got their smart mouth, you know. <laughs> but nevertheless... Our God in prayer knows how to take care of us and how to provide for us. And I'll be honest with you. When I see pictures of those people in the Middle East spreading their rugs and getting down prostrate before their God, it condemns me. Lord, help us that we can always be as open about our worship and our prayer and is dedicated to make sure we take time out of our busy schedule to meet with our God and share with Him and honor Him. We think about His promise of forgiveness in Ephesians 1 and 7. He said, In whom we have redemption through His blood... You for, your forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. It's only through His grace that we're forgiven. But isn't it beautiful that in every single need that God realized we would go through in life, He made a way and He paid a price that we would have access to the power to overcome whatever it was we have to face. Not a single thing that can come up in our life that our God cannot give us the grace, the mercy, and the power to overcome. It's only through Him. He paid the price. How did He pay it? By dying on the cross. And the beautiful thing about it is he didn't just die that my soul can be saved. 
but he died that I could be kept by his power. That I can have power in my life through him living within me. That's why we need to be careful how we treat the temple of the Lord. A few days ago, we were visiting with Sister Leanne and Brother Larry Rackley, and she began to tell me of some experiences that they've had in their life and, and some changes that they made in their temples. And I said, my sister, you ought to be up there teaching that. I tell you, it woke me up. It really did. It made me stop and think. How particular am I of this temple? Do I take it for granted? Do I just give it anything this old flesh wants? Yeah, I usually do. Fried chicken and desserts and cold drinks. Oh, don't you want to go get a Coke or a Dr. Pepper or a Pepsi? That's not good for you. But the old flesh desires it. But what's it doing to our temple? I saw an ad of bacon fried with brown sugar. Did that look good? Oh, my, my. It was just a sizzling up there. I thought, oh, my, that looks so good. You might, I never thought of no brown sugar on bacon. But they had just enough that it was just sizzling on the top. And I thought, if nothing else, I'd like to take just a bite of it and see how it tasted. But you know what I found out a long time ago? That if I bite into it and it tastes good, if I go and Google it or look it up, it's not good for me. But we need to be careful how we take care of the temple of the Lord. That's where the Spirit of God lives. We need to be careful. And I just threw that in extra. It may not apply to you, but it sure does hit me. He gave us the Holy Ghost. The promise that is given to us. The promise not only to us, but to our children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And we need to never let that get old. Somebody get up to preach and they say, we're going to preach tonight on Acts 2.38. And half of us think, I've done heard that. I've heard that so many times. But we need to be reminded. We need to remember for a moment where we came from, what we were when God reached down and picked us up out of that old pit of sin. You might say, well, Sister Dalton, I wasn't that bad. I didn't use drugs and I didn't honky-tonk and I didn't do all these kind of things. Well, I didn't do them either, but I was lost. If nothing else, I had kind of a little... Self-righteous spirit. You know, I'm not going to do that. I don't do that. But I was just as lost as the next guy. I remember when I started seeking God and, and uh, real young and, and uh, we were, had a revival going on. And back then, uh, our revival went for about three months. And um, I want you to know we didn't go home at 7.30. We went home like at Midnight. And some people stayed and prayed all night. That's why we were having that revival. Somebody was paying a price. But I remember going to the altar and seeking God. I never was what you'd call a free sinner. Because when I did something that might be a little, you know, iffy, all the time I was thinking, if the Lord comes, I'm going to be lost. And I remember, though, when the situation worked out to where I could be in church and God began to deal with me and I went to the altar and, 
everybody else was getting the Holy Ghost all the way around me, you know, and I wasn't getting it, and I couldn't understand. I said, God, I know I'm not any worse than they are. I know I'm not doing anything they're not doing, and how come I'm not getting the Holy Ghost and they're getting the Holy Ghost? But you see, I was bound up with unbelief because I had had an experience when I was real young, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I was about eight years old, and then I was told by certain members that there was nothing to the Holy Ghost, that all you did was go up and you started praying and all of a sudden you got all tongue tangled and, and began to uh, not be able to say your words clear and, oh, you got it, you got it, you got it, you know. And I wanted to make sure I didn't get kind of one of those kind of experiences. And so I was actually hindering God from moving in my life because I was more or less seeking after the tongues instead of the Holy Ghost. And I remember the night though I had prayed and prayed diligently all day long and asked the Lord to fill me with the Holy Ghost that night. I was desperate. And when I went to the altar, I prayed and prayed like I always did. And people began to wander away from me and go to the back. And some even began to leave. And the devil jumped up there on my shoulder and said, Now it's time to quit. Everybody's tired of praying. Get up and go on. You know, you can have it another night. And I said, no, I'm going to get the Holy Ghost tonight. I'm staying. I don't care. They can all go home. I'm going to stay here until I get the Holy Ghost. I didn't say that out loud, but I said it in my mind to the enemy that was tormenting me on my shoulder. And I began to just keep praying and keep praying and keep seeking. And all of a sudden, I began to speak in tongues and everybody run back up there. And oh, glory, hallelujah. Oh, what a time we had. But I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you know the devil, he jumped right back up on my shoulder now. He don't give up easy. He said, no, you didn't get it. No, you just got all excited. You didn't get the Holy Ghost. Well, my grandmother had a, you know, back in that day, we didn't have the washer and dryers like we got now, we had a wash shed out back and we had a ringer type washer and a bench there and we had two or three tubs sitting there and she filled all that up with water with a water hose, you know, and we washed and that's the way we did our clothes. Well, I looked for a place that I could get along with God. You see, that's so very important that we find a time and a place that we can really get along with God. And I thought, now where can I go? And I thought about that wash shed. And I went out there and let me tell you something. I began to seek God in that old wash shed. And I asked the Lord to come down and rebaptize me with the Holy Ghost and help me to know without a shadow of a doubt that He had come into my life. I already felt His Spirit, but I needed to hear it. I needed a change that I had not gotten yet. And we never need to get satisfied. We need to keep seeking God, not necessarily for the baptism, but that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we might mature in His Word and that we might be an instrument that He could use in His hand. And I began to seek God. And let me tell you something. We had a prayer meeting in that old wash shed. I didn't care who heard. I didn't care what happened. I didn't care if the cops had drove up. I was having me a time, praise the Lord. Because me and God got together, praise the Lord. And he satisfied that hunger that was in my heart. And it's never stopped hungering. Oh, there's times that I've got to have that brand new touch. There's times that I've got to get alone and once more get under the spout where the glory comes out and allow God to move in my heart and my life and yield myself to God that he can take me as clay in his mighty hand and mold me and make me into the vessel that he wants me to be. And it has to be something between me and him. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But he's still that great Holy Ghost that will come. 
and will give comfort and direction and guidance and power in our life. Praise the Lord. The next thing he gives us in abundance, if we ask of him, is wisdom. Now, these young people, they started a thing, I don't know, several years ago. I don't know. I think Brother Shelby might have started it. But calling me Sister Wisdom. Now, I tell you what, I know it was said in gist and in respect, and I appreciate that. I thank God for it. But I'm not the sharpest tack on the bulletin board. And I realize it more every day. To be wise. There's not a day that goes by that I don't pray. God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom, God, that I can discern the good and the evil. In this world I'm living in, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom to know how to walk uprightly before you. Give me wisdom to know how to guard my mouth and my mind. As Brother Burke taught us our ear. Give me wisdom, God, that I can learn how to be what you would have me to be. But he promised us in James 1 and 5. He knew we was going to be there. And he told old brother James, he said, you write to him and tell him, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give us to all men liberally. Liberally? That's what he said. And upbraideth not. He don't mock us when we ask for wisdom. He don't say How come you're asking for that? He knows why we are. And this is a beautiful part about it. He said, and it shall be given them. We need wisdom to know how to walk uprightly before him. We need wisdom in the choices that we make every day. We're not smart enough to make all the choices that we have to make. Now, I'm not saying that God cares whether you drive a Chevrolet or a Ford. That's you. Or whatever it is you drive. Whatever it is that I'm going to be driving, I'm going to pray for it anyway. And when it breaks down, I'm still going to pray for it. But the thing is, I need his direction every day that I live. Every day, I need to have wisdom. I need to ask him for wisdom. And he will give it to me liberally. In abundance, he'll pour it out to me. If I'll be faithful and I won't abuse it. But you see, I learned a long time ago, it's not me, but him that is in me. Praise the Lord. Strength, he'll give us strength. Galatians 6 and 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Do you ever just get kind of tired? Just tired of, not the Lord, not tired of Him at all, but tired of dealing with some situations? Let's just put it like it is. Dealing with some people. You know, there's some people that can really try you patience. I, I remember one time, and I love her dearly, but I remember somebody one time that kept, I mean, it was constantly, pray for me, uh, calling me, pray for me. Well, we all need help every now and then. And I thank God that when I say pray for me, people go to prayer. 
But this person, I, finally one day I looked at her and I said, uh, you know, it's time you put some legs on my prayers. I mean, I'm praying here until I'm about exasperated. And you're just going back and doing the same old thing. She kind of got her feelings hurt about it. But I told her, I said, I love you. But we got to make some changes ourselves sometimes. Sometimes the need is in our corner to make a change. Not in the other fellows. But I believe with all of my heart that in this last day, in this revival that we're in the midst of, I believe we're going to see backsliders come back to God. I believe they're going to walk in even during our services. There's not going to be an altar call given. They're going to come to the altar. They're going to begin to seek God. I desire to see that. I remember a young lady one time, not in this church, but in another church that we were in, that walked in and went straight to the altar, didn't know anything about what we believed and what we taught, but she began to seek God and cry because she was in trouble and the power of God came down and He filled her with with a baptism of the Holy Ghost and he can do it for others that are hungry and seeking. This used to be something we saw on a regular basis. Many, many times that we come out of the prayer rooms and we never did get any further with a service. It just erupted and God began to move and we began to worship. Let's get back there, praise the Lord. God can do more in five minutes than we can do in two hours, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. I tell you, God wants to give to us liberally, praise the Lord. He wants to strengthen us. If we just, we're just we faithful in our well-doing, we're going to reap, praise the Lord, if we faint not. Don't let the enemy steal your reward. Don't let the enemy cause you to doubt. Don't let the enemy cause you to give up on praying for your children. Don't let the enemy cause you to give up for seeking God for a situation in your life. Because God is still on the throne and he's still able to meet that need. Praise the Lord. A beautiful thing about the promises of God is there's no expiration date on those promises. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm bad about not checking up on expiration dates. Just not long ago, I decided, you know, it was time that I needed to go through my cabinet and check expiration dates. And my, I was shocked at what all had an expired expiration date. I thought, that can't be. But time gets by us. Time goes so fast. Now, you take Brother Kaysen, If it's got an expiration date on there, I don't care if it was yesterday, he's not eating it. (laughs) Brother Cecil's back there shaking his head, it's the truth. He's going to be checking that can for calories or carbohydrates or whatever they're trying to count right now. But along with that, now you know he's got one of them smartphones that he just scans that And it tells him how many carbohydrates or calories or whatever. And he's really trying. Y'all pray for him. It's hard. It's hard for me, much less for a teenager, I tell you. But if it's expired one day, Nanny, this is expired. I said, that is a suggestion date. (laughs) No, it says by, use by. And that was yesterday. I said, well, I'm taking a chance on it. (laughs) He believes in watching that expiration date. But the beautiful thing about the promises of God, there's no expiration date. And you know what? If we've prayed and prayed and prayed about a need... And it comes time that God says your appointment is here 
and you're going on and you're going to come out of the world. I still hadn't forgot all them prayers. They're bottled up and they're still up there. And those kids that you've cried and prayed about and pled with God about, God remembers every one of them tears. He remembers every one of them prayers. And you may be gone. You may be in the grave. But God still remembers, praise the Lord. And he will still work according to what we have asked him to do. Praise the Lord. No expiration date. He said in Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. No expiration date on his word, praise the Lord. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall never pass away. When he promised us that he was going to come again, he's coming. And if we want to take our paper, our newspaper, which not very many of us get the newspaper anymore. That used to be a mainstay. I enjoyed that newspaper. Especially the crossword puzzle. But he, we could take our newspaper and we can take our Bible and we can see that we're living in the end time. Time is running out. Time is running out. He's coming again. There's going to be a rapture. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. How fast does it take you to blink your eye? He's coming. And it's not going to matter how many good intentions you had. There's so many people that I've seen stand and shake under the power of God that was drawing them, convicting them to go to an old-fashioned altar. And they would say, one of these days I will, just not today. I'm not ready right now. Their intentions were one day to be ready. Some of those very same people, I've seen them live their life. Some of them have gone on to meet God. And I never remembered hearing that they ever went and surrendered their life. It's not for me to judge. We're all going to stand before a just God. But according to the scripture, when the spirit draws us, we better respond. When we feel that tug from God upon our heartstrings, and we know we're not where we ought to be, It don't matter what anybody else says. It don't matter what anybody else thinks. All that matters is that we surrender ourselves to God and we find a place of repentance. Yes, I repented and the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost many, many years ago, but that wasn't the last time I ever had to repent. The Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, I die daily. What does that mean? That means that he crucified his old flesh and the desires and the lust of his flesh. Every day he went before God and repented of the things that he he did or that he even might have done, might have thought. We're going to stand accountable for our very thoughts. Nobody knows those thoughts. You know, I read one time, and it's so true, our character, our true character is what we are when nobody is watching. Not what people see out of us. You see, when we're laying there in that coffin, and that preacher is up there, and he's saying all the things that they say, He don't know really what was going on in our heart and our life. I remember one time years ago we had a friend, still got him, but he had a relative that was not a very good person. He could be a good person, but he had a lot of faults. 
and he'd do good for a while, and then he was like the old beggar that went to the woman's house, knocked on the door, back when there used to be a lot of hobos. And she went to the back door, and he said, Ma'am, he said, uh, could I have something to eat? I'm hungry. And he, she said, well, she said, I tell you what. She said, I don't feed nothing but Christians. He said, oh, I'm a Christian. He said, you see these holes in the knees of my pants? That's from kneeling in prayer. She said, well, that sounds good. She said, come on in. She fixed him a nice spread there. And he ate and got ready to go, and he got up and started to walk out. And she said, hold it just a minute. She said, if those he holes in the knees of your pants is, is from kneeling in prayer, what's that bigging in the seat of your britches for? He said, lady, that's from backsliding. <laughs> this relative of his was um, a man that done a lot of backsliding. They had their hopes broken many, many times, hearts broken because they'd get so much confidence that he really was changing. And then first thing you know, he was gone again. And this man died. And I don't know how it came about, but some way a dear friend of ours, Pentecostal preacher, was asked to preach his funeral. And he told us, he said, I'm going to that funeral because he's my, I think it was an uncle or something, I don't remember exactly. But he said, I want to hear what that preacher's got to say about him. He said, you know, when somebody dies, these preachers, they always get up and put them on the streets of gold, and oh, they just, they're already in heaven and all. He said, I want to hear what that preacher's got to say about that man. So I told my husband, I said, well, I don't think he's going to hear what he usually hears out of that preacher, I can tell you that for sure. But nevertheless, after the time of the funeral, we asked him, well, how did it go? He said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. He said he didn't put him nowhere. He just left him in the hands of God. And that's where we all going to be. Nobody knows what our real heart and life is, but God does. And when God begins to deal with us and he begins to convict us and he begins to draw us, don't let anything stop you from yielding to that draw, to that voice of God. Regardless of what it is, yield to the calling of God. God's got something good for you, praise the Lord. We need to work on developing our Christ-like graces, which is our faith, and the knowledge of his word, and our growth as a child of God. Brother Burks preached and taught on being an elder. We all ought to strive to be more mature in the kingdom of God. God needs each one of us. He called us for a purpose. He has a job for each one of us to do. And we need to be sensitive that we can discern what that job is and that we can be faithful in doing what God has called us to do. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says it like this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many of you have seen people and heard people say, Well, I've been hearing that since I was a little child. That doesn't matter. That just tells us, we're that much closer to the fulfillment of God's word. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He does not measure like we measure, but long-suffering. How many? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you has God been long-suffering with? Oh, I could raise both hands and still wouldn't be able to count the times that it's been the long-suffering mercy of God that has kept me long-suffering. That's what I remind myself of when I get kind of put out with somebody, you know, 
that don't always do it right. I think, Pansy, how many times have you not done it right? How many times have you failed? How many times have you let God down when he was dependent on you? How long-suffering he is to usward, not willing that any should perish. Luke 21 and 33 Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Luke 21 and 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts are overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come up on you unaware. That day is not going to come up on us unaware if we're where we ought to be in God. We're going to be able to discern the time and the season. We may not know the exact time, but we can know that it's very soon. And we can make preparation for His coming. Praise the Lord. And I see it even on the horizon today. He is coming. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We're not dealing today with carnal things. We're dealing today with spiritual things. David, the great warrior, he had practiced, he had developed his marksmanship. He had spent many hours on the course to be the mighty warrior that he was. Now, when he killed Goliath, he had not. He had defended the sheep. He had been faithful to make sure that the predators did not get the sheep that was entrusted to his charge. And he had developed the skill of using the slingshot. But I dare to say that in the day and hour that he lived in, most boys knew the skill of the slingshot. From just a tiny lad, when they could first begin to get the strength to throw the stone, they were taught how to use the slingshot. And David was familiar with it. And he used it to the advantage of his dad in protection of the flock. But when he came out that day against that great big giant, and he had nothing against Goliath personally, he didn't, uh, Goliath had, he, he was saying some bad things about him, but I don't believe what he was saying was really making a difference with David. But it was what Goliath was saying about his God that got his attention. He thought, big guy, I don't care what you say about me. I'm just a little old boy and you're calling me a dog. Don't make me a bit of difference. I know I'm a nobody. I was sent here to check on my brothers and they're everyone mad at me. Because I'm out here, they think showing out. But there was something inside of David that when he heard that giant begin to blaspheme and begin to dishonor his God, it caused a fighting spirit to rise up within him. And he said, I can't allow this to happen. I've got to do something about it. It don't matter that I'm the youngest. It don't matter that I'm so small. 
He wasn't like that bunch of Israelites that wouldn't go into Canaan land because of the giants. They said, we look like grasshoppers in our eyes and in their eyes too. He didn't care what he looked like. But oh, that vengeance and that desire to retaliate because of what that man was saying against God caused that young boy to grab that sling, go down to that brook and begin to pick up those stones. And he knew the ones that would be, do the job. He picked them up and he had them in his hand and as he run down toward that giant, he began to run and he began to acknowledge that he was coming to him in the name of the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God took hold of that stone and when it left that slingshot, God directed it straight where it needed to go to bring that giant down. When we live sensitive to the word of God and sensitive to the presence of God, we find that God will fight our battles too. God bless you today. I'm sorry I went over, brother. Somebody should have hit the piano.